Um, good morning, everyone. And um, good morning, and progress. Progress. I think I have an echo. Um, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to South Asian Regional Committee's panel on art and political resistance in South Asia. Before I introduce our speakers today, I'd like to speak a little bit about our organization. Um, the Tough South Asian Regional Committee, or SARC, is a student-run academic discourse and research group um, that strives to promote student engagement with social, political, historical, and economical affairs of the South Asian subcontinent. SARC hopes to create a space for students of all backgrounds and ideologies and identities to foster informed engagement with nuanced awareness of South Asia. Um, my name is Vayama Chadasma, and I'm a senior originally from Mumbai studying history and economics. Um, our panel today hopes to explore the power of art in articulating dissent, looking at both music and visual art and their ability to challenge or fight unjust systems and raise awareness on important political issues across South Asia. We're excited to have three distinguished speakers with us here today, um, Sophia Karim, Sanayana Badwan, and Timothy Thin, who are all actively involved in art and resistance. Um, our first speaker for today is um, Sophia Karim. Sophia Karim has practiced arch architecture for over 20 years. Her practice combines architecture, visual art, and activism. activism. Um, the incarceration of her uncle, photographer and activist Shahidul Alam, that did the development of her theories on an architecture of dis disappearance, in which she explores architecture as a language of struggle and resistance. Her activism focuses on human rights across Bangladesh and India. Her campaign, she campaigns for the release of political prisoners. She's also the founder of Turbine Bag, a joint artist movement against fascism and authoritarianism and a platform for political art and activism. She was a finalist for um, the Jamil Prize for Poetry to Politics in 2021. And she's also exhibited at galleries and museums, including the Tate, um, the Victoria and Albert Museum, Rubin Museum, Right Foot 659, and um, CCLM. Um, she's based in, she's currently based in um, London in the UK. Um, we also have um, Timothy Tin from Myanmar, who's currently based in Bangkok and is studying visual design and school, at the School of Architecture and Design. Um, Tim explores the topics of identity, queerness, and mental health through his work. He's currently working closely with Burmese communities in Bangkok, and Tim's ma interest mainly lies in community art. After the Myanmar coup, Tim has been actively speaking up against the Ratatma regime through his art. Our third speaker is uh, Sunayana, and she describes herself as an evolving artist who has played drums for an all-girls rock band called Who's Gym in College, and more recently has been writing, composing, and singing songs in sol solidarity with people's struggles for love, hope, freedom and justice. She has also been collaborating and composing, composing music um, with youth from marginalized communities. She provides support to marginalized folk in India for making digital spaces and legal rights more equitable and accessible. Um, Sunayana has worked with NGOs and community-based organizations in India towards participatory research and community-led initiatives for over 12 years on livelihoods, land, housing, water, basic services, childcare, public transport, gender justice, and human rights. Throughout her work, the, um, the focus has been on building community knowledge and media, and she's been a strong advocate of the power of art to bring about social change. She is currently working on participatory art-based interventions for water, health, and sanitation in India, and is involved in volunteer work with survivors of violence and marginalized folk artists. She holds a master's degree in political sciences from the Center of Political Studies at um, JNU in Delhi and an uh, honors bachelor degree in political science from the University of Delhi. Um, thank you all for joining us today. We're so excited to have you and speak with us today. We would like to now ask um, each of you to present your opening um, remarks and we'd appreciate it if you keep it to around three minutes. And we'd begin with you, Ms. Kareem, if you would like to start. All right, well, I just really wanted to say thank you very much for having me. Um, I was going to give an introduction, but you've done that, actually. So I won't re, you know, go over who I am or whatever. But I'm just very interested to hear more about the work from our other two speakers, especially Sunaya. I think we might have lots of overlaps. Maybe we can collaborate together. Um. 
uh, Timothy and Sanaya, if you would like to go next, whoever wants to go next, that, that would be great. <laughs> Okay, so I think Tim is being kind enough to give me some space. Um, and I think you've again shared a lot about what I've been doing. Um, and I think I'm more interested in talking about where we're at, um, both in terms of the political context that uh, we as artists are creating music and art in, as well as the audience and the people we're making, or the people who inspire us to make the art that we do. Um, and then again, I think it's important to kind of, of course, kind of look at um, what we define as protest art. And I think there I would just like to pause with all of you and think of all art as protest in some way or the other. And this comes from, I mean, from the very direct and wonderful examples we have from the farmers protest in India that we've seen recently, um, the songs coming out of prisons, which again, I think Sophia and I should definitely mm -hmm. get into. Um, yeah. so there is music even in protest, even in prisons, and at the same time, um, in the daily lives of people. So there I would like to also kind of share more about our connection with folk music and actually how folk music, because it's inspired so much from the culture and the work that people do in their lives, how that is changing. And maybe that also is a sign of protest, which we need to tune into more. So keeping all this in mind, I think uh, it's not just about me being an artist. And I think I'm also not just an artist. I also feel that I'm a citizen of this country, which is going through heavy fascist times. And um, how do we find a voice how do we find a voice for those who don't have a voice in this so-called democracy? And um, in, in that context, how do we understand protest art? So I can share more over time, but I think these are the thoughts that are roaming my mind and I'd like to talk more about that. Um, also, thank you for your introduction. Um, yeah, I don't think I need much <laughs> more introduction about myself. Uh, I, I recently had, well, I recently got the courage to call myself an artist. Um, and it really has been a journey of labeling myself as one. And yeah, today I think I'll be talking more about my own experience working on these works and the, the effects that it had these work as in like uh, my recent artworks and the effect that it had on me, the effect that it had on the effect that I witnessed on other people uh, at where I lived and where I exhibited my works. Uh, yeah, uh, so I'm and I'm very curious to hear more about more from the other two artists that we have here. Yeah, thank you for having me. Thank you. Um, now over to engine for the moderated part of the discussion. Uh, thank you, Wyo. Uh, so hi, everyone. My name is Inje, and I'm a junior currently studying um, community health and poli-sci. Um, before I begin this uh, moderated part of the panel, I just wanted to acknowledge everything that's going on in Ukraine. And I think this is a very timely panel on political resistance, um, since there is just so much going on in the world, including my own home country, um, Myanmar. Um, I think it's important to stand in solidarity with every movement and to me, um, this panel is also about building solidarity across different countries in South Asia, like we have different artists from different countries. Um, so just to go into the structure of this panel a little bit, um, we will start with some general questions and then we'll dive into more specific ones that focus on each movement. Um, so without further ado, I would like to begin by asking, and I know Sunayana touched on this a little bit, but uh, what does protest art mean to each of you? And in other words, like, how would you define art as political resistance? <clears throat> Should I go first or? Is it? Yeah, please do. Anyone right. can go. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, for me, I think um, 
political art, I suppose, is art which not only records um, the current the struggle or, or um, what's happening at the moment, but actually tries to play an active role in the resistance and engages with the struggle. So um, in my case, um, it's the point at which my work became actually linked with direct action is when I think my work turned into what you might call political art. Um, so, you know, a lot of my work is day-to-day -day campaigning and not very, uh, you know, quite un-art stuff. So mainly working with activists, lawyers, journalists, human rights groups, you know, emails, letters, things like that. And then that kind of feeds into the art, um, often in a, quite a subliminal way in my own art. Um, but what it means is that my art's quite fluid and unpredictable. So someone will be jailed and then we begin campaigning for their release and then art emerges from that. And then something else happens, a new crisis. We react to that and then new work emerges. And also um, the work is very, very collaborative, much more collaborative than anything I used to do. Um, so uh, we work together in a very quick, actually, um, open and generous way. We're not precious or kind of possessive about our art. So say on Turbineberg, I've worked, it's now been over two years with hundreds of artists. And I find it quite remarkable that not once has a single artist said, I don't know, like what you did with my work or, um, yeah, or got jealous or anything like that which is pretty surprising, um, you know, art's meant to be about ego. Um, so I think it's because the work and is not really about us, it's a means, means to an end. But I just wanted to say one thing, if I have a bit of time, is that um, I think to me there's also another side of it. So one half of my work is very much engaged in direct action, you could call it proselytizing, it's very direct, loud, and our message is very clear and that's necessary. I mean, every civil rights movement has had that and one must be clear about one's goals. But then the other half of my work is much more ambiguous and quiet and inward. Um, and so my own language of um, expression is still rooted in architecture, which is what I was trained in. And so when I make drawings or make models, I think I'm searching um, rather and questioning rather than giving answers. Um, because that I think you one has to also be open as an activist to keep reassessing one's views and don't become didactical. And these ambiguous spaces of art are interesting. And I believe that that's activism too. So if you think of say music, like the jazz or the blues, or you look at the poems that the prisoners are writing in jail. They're like this. They're in these kind of open places. Thanks. I would like to pick up on protest art being uh, collaborative. Because uh, uh, speaking from experience, I think it was in early February, probably a couple of days after the coup happened. Um, there, a Facebook group appeared on Facebook. I'm uh, sorry, <laughs> on Facebook. Uh, it's called Art for F Freedom for Myanmar, I think. Uh, Art for F Art for Freedom in Myanmar, and it's it was actually made by a friend of mine, and it's basically a group where all the artists gather, or non artists as well, and uh, people either make requests or artists just would like post their stuff. And they would include a link where people can download for free. It usually contains like posters, uh, protest banners, and et cetera, et cetera. Right. And I, I just thought it was amazing. Like, like, like you said, nobody had no nobody mind that before it was it's a pu public source. Uh, nobody cared about be other people using their work. And I'm not gonna be critical about the quality of the work there, of course, but then um, a lot of works were very impactful, very powerful uh, communicative pieces. And it was just, uh, it was amazing to see because uh, one, 
when it first happened in early February, I was mostly at home, just sitting and like feeling bad about what happening. I was I wasn't exactly sure what to do. And uh, when it when it happened, when a lot of people just like, uh, especially because a lot of people were people I don't know, and I just felt like, oh, I'm not alone in this, and you know, it's 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 it, the group itself was very powerful, and then. Uh, I saw a lot of pieces that were done by uh, a, co a collaboration between a, a ton of artists, and it is it is uh, it is something that gives you strength. I would say, I'm not I'm not going to answer the question and define what protest art is, but mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> that is what I feel like about protest art. Uh, of course, I also drew, I also painted, and uh, I also made some design works that were used in protests, um, and maybe you could call them protest art. Um, but at the same time, I was not really thinking, oh, I'm going to make a protest art, right? I was mm -hmm. just more like I was talking about what I was feeling, or I was maybe uh, thinking in shoes and like, uh, and make something. Um, to put that feeling onto a canvas. Yeah. Um, just taking on from what uh, Tim also said, I think it's about not knowing that you're not alone and also knowing that we are not alone. So I think um, protest art personally comes to me because of the struggles I participate in, the struggles I have faced on my own, as well as what we witness. And we might be sitting a thousand miles away from, like you're saying, Ukraine or so close to Myanmar, but um, we feel very strongly for the people and what they're going through. So I think on one hand, um, the art that I have witnessed, the art that's come out of me is very much connected to the struggles that uh, we learn about and we participate in. But I think the other way to look at protest art, um, and this is something that I also heard T.M. Krishna, who's a Carnatic uh, vocalist musician in India, and he's also very vocal about uh, his political thoughts and what is going on in our country, in the world. So he said something very interesting, which is protest art is not just about protesting against the state, but it's also about questioning society. It's also about questioning our own selves and those kind of social norms or um, or the kind of repression that seeps into us at some point. So given that art is also, an, and this is something that people always say, right? That art is a reflection of society, but what kind of society are we talking about? Who is talking about that society? So who are we representing? Am I representing myself? Am I representing somebody else? Is it my place to represent somebody else? So there, what is my role as an artist? Um, can I be more collaborative about the work I'm doing? Can I include, involve more people? Um, so just in terms of uh, sharing a few examples, uh, we can work on community podcasts and community songs and music. Uh, so there was a, there's a little story I'll tell you. So there's a group of women who live in a resettlement colony in Delhi. And um, they wanted to come up with a song to talk about the city and their experience. And what was interesting is when I met them for the first time, they wanted to make a hip hop song. And they were like, why are only boys doing all the hip hop? Why can't we also do it? So here are about eight, 10 women who've never sung or done hip hop before in their life, but they're totally convinced about doing it. And it's because they have something to express. So we got into songwriting and so many experiences that were shared uh, by people came together in a way that everyone could relate to it. There were 10 different stories there, but when we heard the song ourselves, it was really about everyone and any other woman in the city could also relate to it because there were also moments where we questioned, are we representing everyone? Who is missing in our song? Um, so there, there are those kind of conversations you can have. And really, as much as I respect the, the energy and the time and the dedication that a lot of artists have put into learning those skills of being an artist, I think everybody 
loves music for example everybody has music in them everybody can hum somewhere or the other so we need to kind of also tap into that sense of connecting with each other through through art and and i think that gives us the space to also have conversations which is what my next thought i want to share with you is that protest art while it is giving you the space to talk to the oppressor you can't have a direct conversation um say in a village where there are upper caste men who are uh passing lewd remarks on women um who are not allowing women to fetch water from a well close by but there could be so many reasons where you see caste or religious uh communalism basically kind of come in and how do you talk to your oppressor there i feel art is really powerful to have that conversation without uh that direct confrontation and on the other hand that is not the only thing you're doing you are having those direct confrontations but it gives you a sense of a narrative it gives you a sense of who you are what you're fighting for there's a history to what you're fighting so it gives you more context and strength to do what you're doing and i think the on the other side it's also um these conversations that that give us hope so it's also about not just protesting something but dreaming of how an ideal or a more just world would be for you or your community um so protest could therefore take different forms it could be in different um locations it can be in someone's home it could be at the doorstep of some government office it could be on the borders of delhi as we saw uh during the farmers protests and um again like punjab has had a history of art a history of uh, revolutionary poets and singers so there's if you go back in time there was bullisha who existed when there were no borders that existed to now where you have uh, kavar grewal or um the more recent folk artists who are still continuing the folk tradition but what they're saying is changing um how spontaneously they came up with songs that was also very powerful to see that are like it's not something that you have to um it's really about the inspiration and where it comes from so i think there are there are different forms of protest art and different locations of where it's coming from so we need to tune in as much as possible and also make it more inclusive and participatory where people so a song is something that people will sing along with if it's catchy or um a slogan is something that people will shout with you so how can we make art kind of more participate you right? it doesn't just become about the singer or how well you're singing but about how much people are actually connecting and participating in it and that i feel is an important role for artists today and as well as our audiences we shouldn't uh, just we can be active audiences too right so how do we kind of have that conversation as artists Um yeah thank you very much for all of that I do think art is a very powerful form of nonviolent resistance movements uh but I I do kind of now want to jump into more specific questions for each speaker because I just want to give enough space and time uh for each movement um so just for starting off for Sophia uh what inspired you to start the tur- turbine bark and the samosa packet movement and how, I was just curious how all of this movement just came about and what made how, uh what made it have such a powerful impact on you well um so in august 2018 sorry february 2018 i was in dhaka bangladesh with i was with my mom on the street and i was hungry and i bought a packet of we call it shingara in bangla but it's a samosa and um you maybe have the same where these packets are made from throwaway paper newspapers like that. so i noticed that this packet was made from throwaway lists of court cases between the state and citizens and i thought this you know in these authoritarian regimes there are now so many thousands of these cases that they're now appearing on these throwaway food packets but actually i was also really entranced in this object as an art object um the shape the form and so i held on to it and i kind of felt like me and this thing were going to go on a journey some day I didn't know what that would be. Um and then a few months later my uncle um in Dhaka Shohidul Alam he's a photographer and activist 
he was jailed by the government of Bangladesh because he reported on student protests. And I was in London back then, and but we began campaigning. So it turned into this huge campaign. So on the one hand, it was local students and activists in Bangladesh. And then on the other hand, it was us from all over the world. Um, and I suddenly remembered that packet and thought, I wonder if his court case will ever appear on a packet. And I began making my own packets about the free Shohidul movement with kind of our version of the news. And then um, one thing that we did during campaigning for him was that the Cuban performance artist, Tanya Bruguera, had just um, been invited to do, uh, take over the turbine hall in Tate Modern. And somehow we contacted her and said we were campaigning. And she said, come here and do a protest exhibition for your uncle in the turbine hall. And that's like a massive exclusive space that artists don't just get. Um, and so we had these prints, photographic prints that he'd done on extrajudicial killings in Bangladesh. So we did this big protest for him. We did it twice. So then later, um, when the India protests were happening, sort of end of 2019, beginning of 2020, and Shaheen Bagh had happened in Delhi, the women-led um, sit-in in Delhi. I mean, it was huge. It was the biggest women's resistance movement of our time. And I realized that hardly anyone here in the UK had heard of it. And it was led mainly, not only, but by Muslim women. And, um, you know, for all their talk of, being kind of ahead in terms of feminism. Uh, I didn't see women here standing up. You know, they didn't stand up to Trump. They didn't stand up to Boris Johnson. And as a model of kind of feminism, it was way ahead of anything I was seeing here. Um, so we, I was working with activists here and then um, we decided to try and do a protest at Turbine Hall in solidarity with Shaheen Bug. And that was why it's called Turbine Bug. And then we thought, well, what can the protest art be? And I was thinking and thinking, because I could see in Bang, and also it was also about Bangladesh politics. And I could see that Bangladesh, India artists were creating all this work. Then I suddenly remembered the samosa packet because I saw an article that food was really important in Shaheen Bug. And one of the first things they would ask is, have you eaten? And food's important in our culture. So I then thought, I know we could do the protest art on these samosa packets, get all the artists to send their work. I just print it on my mum's crappy broken printer using all old paper from her wardrobes because I had no money. And then afterwards we can send the packets to Shaheen Bug so that they know that what's going on around the world. So that was really how it started. Turbine Hall closed down for COVID, Shaheen Bug shut down for COVID. But we just continued because then there were political prisoners we began campaigning for, other protests erupted, something kept happening and it's just gone on from there. Thank you very much. And adding on to that, and maybe Tim can jump in on this as well. Um, do you kind of see a difference in the way artists use as a tool of political resistance in democratic countries like India, maybe, and versus more authoritarian states like Myanmar is right now? Uh, what are some of the parallels that can be done, that can be drawn, maybe in terms of like suppression of free speech and expression in both countries? It's a, it's a tough question. It is a good question. Um, but at the same time, um, I'm not too proficient in terms of political science. And, but I, in order to answer that question, the question I want to raise is how much of these countries is actually democratic? And how much of these countries is actually authoritarian? Um, but nevertheless, I think the parallel would be we are talking about, we are raising our voice about being oppressed. Um, and in that sense, it is all the same. I am, I, um, I am living in Thailand. Uh, so the, you can, the oppression here is, 
I would say on a, I'm, <laughs> I cannot get too political about the country I'm living in, but <laughs> hmm. you know, the thing is the artist cannot just sit still and do nothing about seeing people oppressed or you personally being oppressed. Uh, so in terms of that, you know, it's, it's a voice, it's a form of, it's a form of, uh, it's something that encourages a lot of it, other people to join in and, and talk about it as well. Um, maybe the difference would be, and it's a, this is a big maybe, uh, the difference could be in democratic countries, uh, art could be, art might not be something that could get you into trouble. So here, I cannot tell you which and where it happened, but in Bangkok, actually, three, four months ago, um, an artist was doing a live painting uh, it was it was going live on Facebook, and uh, it was at a gallery. The gallery just happened to be in in a watch list, um, and the artist got emotional while painting, and he wrote something that could on the canvas. He wrote something that could get him into trouble. Uh, barely, merely in like ten five ten minutes, uh, a bunch of uh, police, a bunch of soldiers with guns and shields showed up to a little street with where people are just eating, drinking, and watching um, the painting happening. You know, I don't think something like that might not happen. I, I don't think it's something like that might happen in in a. Um, sorry, I, did I lack? Uh, I don't think something like that might happen in a democratic country, whereas in authoritarian countries, uh, people are not even surprised that it happened. People are not surprised that uh, they showed up and uh, stopped what's happening. And like, they did not arrest the artist, but they gave him a warning, I think. Um, and you know, those kind of news, you don't hear it at all. I heard it from the exhibition man, uh, the gallery manager personally, because that kind of news, the government would like try to cover it up and not talk about it. Uh, but, you know, it is stopping free speech from happening. Um, and I think that is the difference. Yeah, if, if Sophia or Sunaina want to add on, that's also fine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I would uh, actually agree with Tim because I, as much as we're seeing um, the same thing happen at moments in our country, but we're still apparently a democracy. And uh, just like a small example I would like to share is this song, which is a hip hop song called Azadi, which is by Dub Sharma and then Divine and a lot of people kind of got involved. Uh, it, it was a slogan it is a slogan which comes with the history of being used in Kashmir. Uh, when, when you talk about self-determination, it's something that also was very popular during the CA NRC protests and also has been used uh, widely by student movements in JNU, for example, where everybody was labeled anti-national. Many of these students and the protesters have, and in Kashmir, so many people have been imprisoned. But on the other hand, you see the same song because it's become so popular. It's featured in a Bollywood film, um, Gully Boy, right? And and the song kind of going into mainstream on one hand makes you very happy, but also what is it doing to the song? What is it doing to the context from where the song comes from is also changing. And on the other hand, the other thing that's coming to my mind again, um, which is why I think a lot about prisons today because some of our friends and many activists, lawyers, and so many uh, union leaders and workers and, and minorities who are in prisons right now that we don't even know the names of. But um, there's a song that came out recently as a YouTube video. Uh, it's a song 
on Prisoners by Surendra Gatling, who's one of the co-accused and he's right now in the prison in Bombay, um, who's been charged with terrorist. Um, he's been accused of under this UAP Act, which is the, for the prevention of unlawful activity. So it's basically, in a way, putting people in that category of terrorists or somebody who's going to cause that kind of harm. And he's written a song about his own experience as a prisoner. He's a lawyer who's also pursuing his rights as a, as a prisoner. Um, so there are those kind of moments where we also feel like we're not in a democracy. But at the same time, like I'm sharing, there are these spaces which we still fight for and find. And again, privilege has a huge part to play in what we can do. So while we are out here, um, I think it becomes definitely more important to learn from the struggles and the challenges that uh, friends like Tim face in their countries, but also kind of be more um, conscious of how it's actually happening in our country and not kind of overlooking it. Yeah. Um, I can share a link to this, the song I'm also talking about later. <laughs> Please do, yeah. Uh, so I guess uh, I kind of want to talk about, talk about the, uh, the coup and the military coup in Myanmar and Tim, your work within um, since the coup. Um, so I was, I know that you do a lot of work that are more focused on grief and loss, you know, after a traumatic event has occurred. And I was just curious, um, how did art became a space for people from Myanmar to kind of grieve and process all of this loss and trauma that they've been facing for the past year or so? And how does this sort of become political? Um, I think for this, I would like to share my screen and show you a bit of, is that all right? Yeah. Um, all right, I think I'll just, Awesome. Uh, so there, I was a part of an exhibition in both curating and uh, being an, uh, as an artist as well. So this was this is good. This exhibition was uh, it was held on February first, twenty twenty two. And I know the poster is too much, uh, but and that was our intention because that is how we feel. Uh, you know, it's, it looks fun, but at the same time, it's so chaotic. Um, and that's how we're trying to process what we have lost um, and what we're trying to do to overcome that loss. Uh, so this exhibition was called In Exile. Um, and it is about people in exile uh, after and because of, because of the coup and or for other political reasons prior to the coup as well. Uh, and I would like to share a story of, of uh, honestly, I was not, I did not know what to expect out of that exhibition. I was there the whole time. And there was an old lady, uh, she may be like, maybe she's about 60, 70, um, she was there she we also had Burmese food there so she was eating and then she took her time looking at the exhibition um and it was very and she came down and uh she couldn't like talk to us at all she was just like trying to leave as in like um not in a bad way more like she was just um, and we were like, oh my God, what happened? And uh, she was crying and she was, um, and she, uh, she gave us a hug and she told us that uh, she hasn't had a chance to really process what has happened in the previous year. Um, that is when I realized uh, what we, how we could have, uh, how we could be helping. Um, I have been doing a lot of work, which I will show you in a bit, um, but I honestly did not know uh, and did not, uh, I just did not know what to, how it could help other people because they were never in public. I just posted them on my social media and that was basically it. Um, 
so in that exhibition, uh, there were maybe uh, there were seven artists uh, who are all Burmese, who are all Myanmar from Myanmar. And my work is is uh, it's called Making Home. Uh, so what I did was uh, because I am a Burmese person living in Thailand, trying to make home here. So this word it means home, and I made I made this word using um, the Thai alphabets, the Thai elements. So the construction itself was pretty straightforward, and I made it. I made it for a lot of other languages as well. Um, in K Korean, Chinese, Cambodian, a lot. Um, so, but in the exhibition, what I did do was I installed it as a huge canvas where people can write whatever they want. Um, concerning with the word home, what it means for them, what it is for them. Um, and the result was, it was very interesting. Um, a lot of people wrote places, a lot of people wrote people, um, other people, and some people wrote phrases, poems, and a lot of people wrote food. Um, some people wrote, <laughs> this one says, uh, warm steamed rice yeah. uh, and this one says I want to go back and this one says why did I cry when I left and you know even if you did not write anything but a lot of people actually did not write anything um, and this one says I want the warmth back um, this one just says me. <laughs> uh, you know, a lot of people did not wrote, did not write anything, but it was an exercise. It was a homework for them, right? Because they were just not thinking about what it is for them, but they were also reading what other people wrote uh, about home. And for your context, and I've already said this, uh, well, this was in Bangkok. So uh, everybody, is away from home in a sense, uh, at least in a physical sense. And that is how, that is what I meant by how people has been, how I've been trying to help people grieve at least um, uh, because they, they can, that's when they know that they are not alone in this, um, they are not, um they are well they are not alone and this is a conversation to each other like you don't even know who wrote which but um it connected i think this connected to a lot of people um another word another work that i uh have done is this one um this is not quite finished yet but um i named this outsider because that is what I feel like. I'm not really in a house. It's, well, it is a house, but you know, whenever I read the news, that's what I feel like. Um, it's like you being an outsider to your own house and, and what's happening there. Um, and I, I think, most of you would maybe all of you would agree sometimes like those feelings are really hard to say it out loud it's hard to process you you most of the time you're in a bad mood and you don't even know what's going on um and i think that's when art comes in and it helps you even even if you don't know what what you're feeling it helps you feel something i think um yeah, so that's um, that. That is how I have been processing, and how I've been trying to use art, art as a tool for for people. Um, did I answer your question? <laughs> yeah, Tim. Uh, thank you so much for that. Uh, I think that's a very really, uh, powerful movement that you did. Uh, 
but I just had one more question for Sunayana and then maybe we can jump into questions from the audience. Um, so I know that you talked a lot about uh, community artwork that you have done by collaborating with youths from marginalized communities and making digital spaces more accessible. Um, I'm curious to know more about your this work that you do and how like you like like I uh, like I asked Tim like how this work becomes political and in other words like do you think community art could be categorized as a uh, political art form? Well, Um, thanks for sharing uh, your thoughts too, Tim. Um, so I'm just thinking of sharing a few thoughts with all of you. And I think, uh, so one is the community project that I spoke to you of, and then we did a similar kind of project on how to actually create um, community podcasts in which we also used that as a forum to come out with our own poetic kind of expression of what is going on in our communities. And uh, this was also happening during the time of COVID. So again, the digital is all over us. And while we are having these experiences in our real lives, how do we kind of leverage these digital spaces? How do we make sure that everybody can use these tools? Otherwise, and that's what happened during COVID. We were seeing a lot of artists kind of do live uh, telecasts and uh, live concerts from home. But like you realized a lot of folk artists who were disconnected from the digital spaces and digital world um, needed to kind of have a voice. So there you do the support work you need to do using your privilege if you have, uh, if you recognize that you have privilege. Um, and there you kind of step back and you don't have to necessarily be the artist or someone who's kind of guiding that entire uh, process. So the roles you can play can also enable art and its expression in a different way. And I think um, community art is political in its own way because every community has a context, has a history, has a language, which is also, communicate, which is also communicating more with your own people. And um, I think that's what we need more. We need more conversations. And um, as polarized as our countries are becoming, I think it becomes a, a way to kind of open up spaces to have conversation like I was sharing earlier, to even have those conversations with the oppressor, whether it's in our social context or in the political context. So yes, community art is uh, political, um, but also how much people participate in it, how much people can relate with it. So even as an outsider, if you're collaborating with uh, communities and artists, how do you kind of make it really speak to the people? Um, so therefore I choose, I mean, I love listening to music in all languages, but I choose to sing in Hindi, Punjabi, Urdu, because one is that is where I come from. It's also uh, to share the history um, of my ancestors. We were also affected by the partition and all the politics that came with it. Do I want to be separated from that history? No, I still feel a connect. So much of my culture connects to the culture in Pakistan. And actually a lot of people have been also reaching out and listening to my music from Pakistan because of the language. So you, you have to also kind of, I guess, see it in a political way rather than making it necessarily political. And just to kind of share an example from the work that I've been doing recently. So the songs that I've been making are also coming from a very political experience, very personal experience where um, you're literally watching a friend being arrested and taken away. And I haven't seen that friend in the last two years. Um, again, charged with um, horrendous um, UAPAs in our country. Um, and on the other hand, you kind of um, don't want it to be just your experience. You want to talk to people about it in a language that, again, people connect with. So um, this idea of bringing art together um, in a way that if I'm singing a song today and tomorrow if somebody else is humming that song and maybe not even seeing it for the reasons that I am writing the song. So I, the first song I wrote is a love song and you know all artists start with a love song so i was like let me start with a love song 
but it's actually about separation it's actually about uh waiting for justice waiting to be reunited with your loved one who's in prison and there are some slight references to an emergency like situation where um there is no way to really talk about things openly or you don't know when the mulakat is going to happen and mulakat means your legal meetings um so there is a way to kind of also have these conversations with people where people also wrote back me i had police um officials also follow me since i wrote that song and that was actually one of the best moments for me because i'm like hey i can have a conversation with you um usually otherwise you know we're always standing on opposite sides but if a if someone working in the police department is connecting to a song is at least willing to listen to a song and have a conversation i think that for me was really like maybe i should keep doing this because otherwise we all get um boxed and i think we need to really think out of the box break out of these boxes um so yeah make making art more participatory working with um whatever you have around yourself uh the sounds uh, for example the rhythms that we use so how do you teach something like a simple rhythm that you need to have that keeps that connects you right so the work that i was doing with the women in uh, khadar in madanpur khadar the resettlement colony we uh, so we did this exercise where everybody i asked everyone to just explain how because everybody especially women are forced to do a lot of domestic chores so i'm like okay i guess every one of us here washes clothes at some point or the other what sound do we make and everybody had a different rhythm which was great so everybody has a unique sound a unique kind of rhythm to their daily lives but if we had to come together to settle at one rhythm and then that rhythm kind of led to us kind of arriving at a beat that we could go with and work on the song so there's that and then again coming back to the farmers protests where we've seen um songs which are very um which are folk songs and it's so much about uh agriculture it's so much about labor it's so much about the strife the struggle the hardships um and at the same time you also have hip hop artists and like the more contemporary artists who've done hip hop numbers which have also spoken to the youth who may not necessarily be uh tuned into folk music all the time so point being that i think we also have to be if we are really making political art or if we want it to be having a conversation we need to also think of who we are reaching out to and who we are trying to have that conversation with is it the state is it our own people is it um a larger community is it somebody who is um who we can see solidarities with also and we need to connect more so yeah um thank you very much and on that note like thank you very much to all our wonderful panelists um i think this has been such a great discussion but with respect of time i think there's only like 4 minutes left um i'd like to begin the audience q and a session which will be moderated by wayo um over to you wayo thank you yeah thank you everyone for your discussion it was really great um i'm just going to read out some questions that have been posed by the audience So the first question that we have is from Priya and it's directed to Sophia. Um um she says can you tell us more about an architecture of disappearance? And sort of just linking that to, like I think all of you have touched upon art as a language of like struggle and resistance. So if anyone wants to put in their input to like elaborate on that for also after that that would be great. Yeah, um I'll try and do it quickly because we have 4 minutes. Um basically the moment that my uncle was jailed I was very busy campaigning during the day and at night I suddenly began to process things in terms of architecture and I started to construct the spaces that I imagined he was in in my mind and I think it's because I was trying to build them so that I could enter them and be with him because I knew he was alone I knew he'd been tortured um he was in remand under interrogation um and so that was really the point at which I began expressing the work i do now through the language that i ultimately know which is architecture which that's the language i was trained in you know i'm not a musician I, i'm not a poet and so i really have no choice but to um use that but it was interesting to me because i think 
although there's a tradition of other art forms, a strong tradition being used as the art of dissent. So we've talked about song, poetry, visual art. Architecture hasn't really been used um, as a form of dissent as such. Um, but I think it's one of the most profound languages that one could use. And I think there's something, there's an inherent connection between architecture and human suffering and the human condition. And just to finish, I mean, it's a really long thing to explain, but I guess, you know, people like to look at things. So I'll just quickly, oh, I think I need to share screen. I'll really quickly show you uh, a series of models I made, uh, if I do share screen. And these models were based on my uncle's memories of jail. And I built them um, using my imagination and his memories. Can you see them? Yes, we can. That's it. Yeah. Thank you. That was really great to see. Um, I think we've run out of time. Um, we have someone from the audience um, saying that they would love to see more examples of all of your works and um, support all of you all as, an, uh, as artists. So I think we could send out like links or details later on regarding everyone's work. And um, lastly, um, something that we wanted to mention was that where um, plan Sark as a student organization is planning to have a fundraiser in the next couple of weeks um, to raise funds for the Tobin Bark project and also for um, um, Myanmar in general. So we will be putting out um, information about that um, coming mon on Monday onwards. And we would love it if everyone could contribute to this because these are, as you can see, really great causes and um, the work that's being done for is really incredible. Um, thank you so much, Sophia, Tim, and Sanayana for uh, coming and joining us today. This was a really great panel and we all learned so much from it. Um, and it was great to have you all here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much. And just sharing some links for people to listen to some music maybe after this conversation to connect and stay connected to what's happening in the world. So Naya, can we stay connected now or you have to go? Or we can do it separately if that's easier. Yep, I think we can connect one on one because this is the university um, link and then maybe we can have a open conversation and Tim, feel free to join us. Yeah. Uh, for sure. Oh, quickly to give you a comment. Uh, I really love what you're doing, both of you. Um, uh, I love the idea of picking up a random object and, you know, thinking of uh, making something out of it as well. Uh, I read a book called Objects and it is exactly what, is, what it's doing. Uh -huh. um, and also for Sunayana, um, I recently read Under Commons and my favorite quote from that book is um, turning the noise into music. And I feel like that's exactly what you're doing with community art and that's amazing. So thank you for sharing. Likewise, Tim, big respect. <laughs> yep, yes. and just before we leave, I think the other thing that's now coming to my mind is collective memories. Like we've shared this conversation and I think we've created a memory, but, um, and the disappearances we're talking about. So as much as that is being erased or forced out of our psyches, we need to kind of maybe use art to also create that history and remember and not forget basically to acknowledge all the struggles and what everybody is going through. So collective memory is great and art can help. 
Thank you. All right, thank you. Hi. Thank you so much. I think we should end this panel now, <laughs> this mm -hmm. webinar, but we would love to stay in touch with all of you. And if you could send us your links and of your work and every your pages, your websites, we could share with the Tufts community as well. So, and then thank we plan on, yeah, we plan on doing a fundraiser because I do think funding is a good uh, act of solidarity for all the movements. So thank you so much for coming. <laughs> Thank you very yeah. much for having us.